We continue by beginning chapter 22, which is chapter 6 of part 4. The second tour of Galilee and return to Capernaum. Immediately after this, Jesus began another circuit of preaching and miracle working, going from village to village and from city to city, preaching the happy news of God's kingdom. Luke 8, 1 through 3 is what we're going to bounce some of this off of. On this tour, he was accompanied by his twelve chosen apostles and by many women whom he had cured of evil spirits and other infirmities. This companionship with Jesus was not out of the usual order of things since it was customary for women of means, especially for widows, to contribute of their substance to the support of rabbis whom they reverenced. See Jerome on 1 Corinthians 9.5. Three are mentioned as being in this company, namely Mary called Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna. The first of these so devoted herself to Jesus that she became his chief friend among women. And it may be worthwhile to make a summary of what we can learn concerning her. Well, it would have been the opposite of the ordinary for a rabbi not to be married. And likewise, they would not have tolerated him being hung on by the, by the women um, if they weren't his family. So they could have all been his wife. There could have been... Um, Could have been siblings, but that doesn't make as much sense. But in the first place, it should be repeated that there does not appear the slightest reason for believing that she had been an extraordinarily bad woman, particularly that she was a prostitute, but quite the contrary. Yeah, someone's chief familiar among women. Come on, that's... Woman's got to be his wife. Here is one of those unhappy cases in hi history in which some misapprehension has occurred, which has succeeded in branding a name with an undeserved infamy and perpetuating it through generations. Let us see what is said about her and the... Catholic authorities that did so obviously have no spiritual authority to speak if they're going to utter such things, right? Fine, if they quote the right thing, they're an authority, but, you know, as, as individuals, you know, you can't trust what the rulings were. El Mejdel is the name of a Muslim village, as Robinson calls it, which is most probably the representative of the town on the western shore of the lake of Gennesaret, known as Magdan, in the days of Jesus, and so called in the chief manuscript, although in the authorized English version, and in the usually received Greek text of Matthew 1539, it is written Magdala. It was one of the many Magdolim, you know, that's not the right plural, thank you very much, which existed in Palestine. But Professor Stanley's description seems to embrace every point worth notice of all the numerous towns and villages in what must have been the most thickly peopled district of Palestine. Only one remains. A collection of a few hovels stands at the southeast corner of the plain of Gennesaret, its name hardly altered from the ancient Magdala or Magdal, so called probably from a watchtower of which ruins appear to remain that guarded the entrance to the plain. A large solitary thorn tree stands beside it. The situation otherwise unmarked is dignified by the high limestone rock which overhangs it on the southwest, perforated with caves 
recalling by a curious, though doubtless unintentional coincidence, the scene of Corriego's celebrated picture. Corriego's? Okay. I'm, I'm, I don't know what he's talking about, though. The unfortunate identification of the saintly and loving friend of Jesus with the sinner who bathed the feet of Jesus with her tears has made Magdala this Mary's birthplace familiar to all modern languages. She comes before us first in this passage in St. Luke associated with women a great respectability. These ladies were Joanna and Susanna the former was the wife of Chusa, the steward of Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee. It is not to be supposed that this lady of the court would associate herself with a woman of the city, a streetwalker, a prostitute, or probably even one who had had that reputation. Moreover, the fact that Mary was engaged with these ladies in ministering to the personal wants of Jesus shows that she, as well as each of the others, had means at her own disposal. She was not a woman of the lower ranks, and point either of property or of reputation. In this passage, see Mark 16, 9, the fact is stated that out of her Jesus had cast seven devils. Modern thought has been accustomed to associate demoniac possession with the idea of bad moral character in the possessed. Well, sometimes it's bad beliefs, which, however, is a very great error. Children, women of good repute, people in any class of society had been liable to this terrible disease. It was, it is a very popular <clears throat> It is a very proper remark, therefore, that we must think of her as having had, in their most uh, aggravated forms, some of the phenomena of mental and spiritual disease, which we meet with in other demoniacs. The wretchedness of despair, the divided consciousness, the preternatural frenzy, the long-continued fits of silence, well, often people are silent because people have been yelling at them or otherwise mistreating them. Her case had been so marked and painful that the contrast it afforded with the serenity of her condition, after the great healer had restored her, made such an impression upon those who were familiar with the circle of Jesus, and who afterwards chronicled their movements that were repeated mention is made of the fact. It seems probable from the whole history that other women came and went and did for Jesus all their love prompted and their means allowed, but Mary Magdalene never forsook him. Joanna and Susanna were not with him in his last moments. Mary Magdalene was, well perhaps Mary Magdalene was present when the other ones were as you could say the chaperone, um, allowing those others to be present. She was then accompanied by the wife of Alphaas and the wife of Zebedee. She remained even after Mary, the mother of Jesus, had left the sight of horror. Further indication that she would have been the wife. From reading all the accounts in the four historians, well, mythologists, um, it would seem that there was a crowd of women sorrowfully present at the execution, but all standing far off. Some sign from Jesus, or the promptings of nature, sent his mother Mary, and his aunt, and his friend Mary Magdalene, and his disciple John, up near the cross. When Jesus had committed his mother to the disciple, the latter drew her away to the city. It would have made sense that he was 
a brother. The aunt seems to have accompanied the mother, so that only Mary Magdalene was present. Mary, the mother of Jesus, joined her, probably coming up from the crowd which stood at a distance and sat down with her besides the sepulcher, and the whole story puts Mary Magdalene forward. This much of the history we have been compelled to anticipate to make clear the case of Mary of Magdala, the sweet and suffering saint. Her love never faltered. The other women stood afar off. She stood close to the cross, where she heard all his last words and groans. She endured the sight of the death of him, whom her heart adored. She was present, perhaps, tenderly aiding, when the body was taken down, and when it was wrapped in fine linen, and probably assisted in depositing it in the sepulchre. And then with her friend Mary, the mother of Joseph, she sat down over against the sepulchre. All her attentions were such as the daintiest love gives to the most honorable and dearly beloved. She had regarded him as a man, but as the holiest, most gifted, most charming of all the sons of men. Oh, they're spelling with an O. She saw him buried, and had no hope, nor even thought of his resurrection. She wrapped her heart up with her Lord in the linen cloth. They wound about the precious limbs. Well, at least they got the right case with the Lord, right? Because um, they're not talking Yahweh, they're talking... They're a sp human spiritual leader. The next day was a sorrowful Sabbath, and on the morning following... She went to the sepulchre and found it empty. She saw angels there. But one Jesus was, to her worth, more than a thousand angels. She flew with anguish to Peter and John and ran back with them to the sepulchre, crying, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And then she sank down almost to the verge of that horrible pit of mental disease from which she had been lifted. When Jesus came, she did not perceive that it was he he spoke. He said, Mary. Probably it was the one tone in which he had always spoken to her. It thrilled her back to the widest consciousness, and she rushed forward to clasp his feet. Again, further indication that she would have been the wife, because you don't touch the male that's not a relative. Um... I mean, you don't shake hands or anything. Um, can there be anything more beautiful than this? Every great man, great in purity as well as power, has some special honored friend among women. Which friend is not his kinswoman? Well, some people marry more than once, but such Jesus had, and that nearest and dearest friend was Mary called Magdalene. It was not fitting that he should marry. Why? His mission was too awful. No, no. Um, he was to stand in sublime, uh, sublime solitariness. He had no earthly father. He was never to have a bodily descendant. Again, that's reading into it. Um, but he had a human heart. I must have had craving for human love. He was the incarnation of goodness had no, no fierce words of denunciation for fallen women whom he raised as well as forgave, but his whole record is so spotless that it shocks us to think that such a being could have found his best beloved friend in a former prostitute, and that she, who would have been so morally degraded, could have had more than any other woman the fineness of soul to have been able to appreciate Jesus and attach herself to such a man with such adherent love. Now, you can, you can be the disciple, but what, what he, the idea of Jesus seeking love with a, with a woman um, that's not his wife and refusing to marry because that would be a bad idea, um, it, it doesn't make him sound good, right? Um, she was a beautiful character. She'd been a great sufferer. Jesus had healed her. She was all the finer for what she had endured. She was the watchful attendant of his footsteps. Hers 
were probably the last human eyes into which the dying eyes of Jesus looked, and hers the first human eyes he is represented to have shown himself. Unto when he came back from the grave, this is all that is told. Well, it doesn't say the person with seven demons was Mary Magdalene, but... Um, It is most exquisite. The utmost delicacy is here. It is the sweetness, not the words of the narrative, which betrays the holy love. And after that last interview in which Jesus showed her how mortal affection must be lifted into religious worship, there is nothing more said of Mary. And then history takes this beautifulest love of all the world and mars it and blotches her name and associates her with all the fallen of her sex. It is to us. See, history in the same way that the gospel writers or historians write. It is to us one of the most awful problems of human biography. Hers was a bitterly beautiful lot she had suffered, she had recovered, she loved her healer. She never could be asked to cross a certain line, but there she was met, met more than any other woman by the confidence and affection of the most exceptional of all marvelously fine characters. He died looking at her. He rose and showed himself first to her. If she lived to be a century old, she had such a memory as never has been vouchsafed to any other woman. In her real life, she was lifted to a heaven of love. In history, she has been cast down to a hell of infamy. Let her be restored. The truth is not restore her. The friend of Jesus was a blessed saint. When Jesus and his party returned to Capernaum, so great was his fame that crowds assembled about the dwelling, and pressed his fame, oh, it impressed them so much that they could not even eat bread, and we're going to be, you know, this is around Mark 3, 19 to 35, Matthew 12, 22 to 50, Luke 11, 14 to 54. His mother and brothers, learning how he was exerting himself, and how the crowds are pressing him, said he is beside himself, and went to restrain him from such excessive labors. Although they did not believe in his doctrines, they loved his person, and had tender care for him. But the multitude blocked the entrance. Meanwhile, there had been brought to him one possessed of a demon, and at once blind and dumb. It could not necessarily go into the question of demoniacal possession every time an incidence of this species of ailment appears. The reader is referred to the ample discussion given on this subject on page 172. It was certainly the most exacting demand upon power to heal this complication of mental and physical disease. If the objective theory of demoniacal possession be held, then some evil spirit had found in this human soul an organ it could use, and in malignity had deprived the victim of sight and speech. On the subjective theory, the psychical ailment had struck out and had bedumbed and blinded the patient. In either view, Lang has graphically described the case in his Le Ben Jesu, which he says, shut up in this most shocking manner did this being come before Jesus like a dark riddle of hellish restraint and human despair. The simple statement of the historian is, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. This was a culminating marvel. It was a manifold miracle. It showed the power of Jesus over nature. 
and supernature. It threw the populace into an ecstasy. They hailed Jesus with messianic salutations. They cried out, Is not this the son of David? At this time, there had come down from Jerusalem to Capernaum delegations from the scribes and Pharisees engaged in the work of laying snares for Jesus that they might with impunity put him out of the way. Affairs had now reached a climax. He'd raised the son of a widow in Nain. He had made a circuit through Galilee, increasing his train and his fame. He had returned to find the people regarding him with greater reverence and wonder than before. And he had cured the possessed man, opening his eyes and ears and restoring him to mental sanity. He had thus aroused the popular enthusiasm to a degree that they were ready to crown him king and accept him as the Messiah, and he would not rank himself with the ruling class, but had set his influence directly against their authority. The hour had come when something must be said. The unfortunate expression which other sons of Mary had used in kindly meaning towards Jesus, namely, he is beside himself, was probably suggested. If not, it was seized by the hierarchic party and employed against him. You see that his own mother's sons say that he is deranged. The truth is that this fellow has Beelzebul and cast out devils only through Beelzebul, the prince of devils. Now this is the word in the original, not Beelzebub, the name of the Philistine entity. Well, they didn't call themselves Philistines. Um, and it was actually broader than that, but was Paul Zabul, Lord of the Fly. No, no, that's not a translation. Lord of Copulation. Lord of the Flying Things is Baal Sibub. Worshipped is represented by the Skirbaas, Pilolarius, or Dunghill Beetle, Beelzebul, which means, no, it doesn't mean Dung God, um, Lord of Cohabitation, is a form given according to custom of the Jews who had a, had of changing a letter so as to convert a word into another having a contemptible signification. As it does not appear earlier in Jewish literature, it may may it not have been invented to deride Jesus on this special occasion. Um, well, Baal-Zabul is definitely something that occurs before, but Zabub, um, Lord of the Golden One, right? But they would, the Jews would blaspheme other things. That's why we have the name Palestinian. It is to be noticed that they do not deny the apparently hopeless condition of the patient nor the greatness of the miracle which Jesus had openly performed in the presence of them all. You know, the Peloshim, you know, the wanderers, could have been what that group would have been called, for example. They did as other men do when a great good deed has been performed by one whose goodness they do not desire to admit. They assigned the good deed to a bad motive and a wicked source. The accusation roused Jesus. He called them nearer to him and addressed them first in parable. Every kingdom divided against itself is desolate, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If the Satan cast out the Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? Whatever anarchy there may be in this kingdom of the Satan, there is the point of unity, that all its energies are directed toward marring where he cannot destroy the kingdom of God. 
He shows how this perverse bitchiness is caught in its own net. There is certainly one course of conduct which cannot be said to be instigated by Satan, and that is such conduct as shows the actor's determination to do all he can to overthrow Satan. This is the brief and conclusive reply. But Jesus furthermore said, If I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. He calls attention to the fact that he was not the only healer of these terrible maladies. Well, there's a difference between an exorcist and a healer, but um, that there were those among the sons or disciples of the Pharisees who had been healers, and whose success had always been attributed to the aid of the Spirit of God. See Acts 19.13, an account of the traveling exorcists, the seven sons of a high priest. The argument of Jesus has the same force, whether the ordinary Jewish exorcists did really cast out demons or were only believed to have done so. In either case, their success was always spoken of favorably, and that the greater deeds of Jesus should be attributed to a bad source shows the malignity of his accusers, and that was all his argument was intended to establish. And a lot of things just seem to be, or it's just like for the moment, it's like, oh, well, we won't bother for a moment in order for this person to get faith in you or faith in, you know, your path. So that's something to watch out for in exorcist claims too, right? His works in this department surpassed those of their sons in the greater malignity of the cases cured, in the suddenness of the relief afforded, and in the authority with which he spoke the word of power. The people testified, Matthew 9.33, on one occasion that, it was never so seen in Israel. Some milder forms had yielded to the spiritual influence of some of the healers, but never in such a manner had they seen such a case so thoroughly cured. Well, maybe, you know, it's not seen in Israel as in, as in it's, you know, not done at the time to this degree, but never done before. Yeah, there's a lot of overshooting and claiming that Jesus was that unique. Um, as we see, that wasn't the case with anything, really, um, you know, of his time, you know, but, you know, not you know, outside his time and place. But if the one had no con uh, no collusion with Beelzebul, the other must not be so charged. If not of the evil one, it must be of God. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. A celestial surprise had come upon that generation without their expectation. The kingdom of God had come in on them, and whether the Pharisees believed it or not, the long prayed for kingdom had come, and this was the king of that kingdom. Now, uh, the mention of Beal as, you know, as a as god of this, well, uh, that, that could have been the implication because Baal was not a term that was used for the king, at least later on, but, um, and we certainly have Baal as one of the titles of Yahweh for a time that say, don't call me Baal, call me Ash, uh, Bali, you know, no, uh, call me Ashi. Um, what's that? What's that verse? Um, but Jesus is like in the role for the Christians as Baal, um, son of El. Sometimes performs sacrifice, sometimes is the sacrifice. There were those myths going around, and it goes from the bull sacrifice cults, and they were taking it to an Aries thing and a Pisces thing, and um, mixing that stuff in. So, yeah. Jesus represents himself as more powerful than Satan. How can one enter the house of the strong and carry off its instruments? except he first bind the strong. The word means all the furniture which constitutes the outfit of the house, all the vessels and instruments. 
and then he can plunder his house. In these words, Jesus claims to have power to bind the evil one and wrench the prey from him. When a man of power is able to defend himself against the ordinary robbers, is openly deprived of his goods in broad daylight by one whom he sees. Then no one is so much a fool as to say that the strong man robbed himself. All say that someone who was able to bind the strong man had done so, and then spoiled him. Jesus declared that a stronger than Satan had come. The Messiah was declared to be the hero of God. Well, any of the real messiahs were, that was the point. All such prophecies as are represented by the passages in Isaiah 49, 24, and more particularly 53, 12, he shall have the strong ones for a prey or attributed to him. Now, Jesus declares himself that mighty one, and he pushes the ecclesiastical clique of inquisitors and persecutors a little harder. He plants himself against Satan. These two champions are at war for the empire of the world. One is to conquer. All must take sides. There is no neutrality. The fight is over the surface of the universe. Satan is to be destroyed. Are Jesus. All who are not for Jesus are for Satan, and thus he swiftly retorts, the charge, and shows them to be in league with Satan by opposing him. There is no passivity possible to a rational being. Whoever does not collect in aid of me scatters. He that does not help the work of Jesus breaks down and scatters the work of God. Opposition to Jesus is allegiance to Satan. Well, Matthew 7, 22, 23 indicates that doing things in Jesus' name is such that gets you cast out by Jesus, and therefore you would be in opposition to Jesus by worshiping him. Jesus then uttered one of the most profound and mysterious sentences which ever fell from his lips. Few people have been able to read it without shuddering. It is so important that I shall present a careful translation, hoping to be helped thereby to a better understanding of the words. The passage in Matthew is, because this is the case, I say to you, every kind of and form of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men, but the blasphemy of the Spirit shall not be forgiven. If one speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but if one speak against the Holy Spirit, you know, Gabriel, it shall not be forgiven him in this age, nor in the coming. You know, because you refute the role of Revelation entirely. Well, not refute as much. Uh, um, deny is the right word. Um, in Mark, it is assuredly, amen, I say to you, that all sins shall be forgiven to the sons of men and the blasphemies, whatever they shall have blasphemed. But whoso shall blaspheme in reference to the Holy Spirit has not forgiven us for an age, you know, during the on, um, but is held bound by perpetual loss. And, you know, during the age of, you know, a particular prophet at the very least, um, Mark says that he uttered these words because the Pharisees had said he had a filthy spirit. The word does not mean coming together as a 
crowd collects upon the street, but rather conveys the idea of gathering a harvest. Oh, whoever does not collect. Okay. Because I passed over that, I think. Um, the passage in Luke gives no variation from these two. We may be helped to the meaning of this evidence of recollecting that it is a warning and that the Pharisees had not yet committed this fatal offense and also that whatever the destructive sin may be it is a sin of words of speech rather than of action or of thought the perpetrator uh, the perpetrator of this hopeless sin must have said it it is blasphemy against the holy spirit not a sin against the holy spirit it seems to be an open outspoken Betraction of the Holy Spirit of God, deliberately uttered by man, whom, when he knows what he says to be false, and says it for the distinct purpose of committing spiritual suicide. The enemies of Jesus had not yet done this. They had said that Jesus had an unclean spirit, and this they had uttered in the heat of passion. Nevertheless, that speech had come out of bad hearts, and he kindly warns them to beware lest they come to such a state as to be able to commit this fatal crime. They were blaspheming the Son of Man in their anger, and because the Holy Spirit of God was in him as he claimed, they might be persistent wicked intent against him, come to some such state as to be able to do what would be endlessly destructive to their souls. The sense in which Jesus uses the word on age is important to know. In the lexicons, it has a different meaning, as has the corresponding adjective, anil, which seemed to signify the continuous duration throughout the period referred to. And that period, the duration indicated by an, must be understood by this context. One of the most striking characteristics of the teaching of Jesus is the absence of all metaphysical terms. Well, the Bible has been stripped of a lot of its spiritual import as such. Thus the phrase, Aiston Aiona, which I have translated by the two phrases for an age or during the am. Don't we see that exact? Is that the exact phrase on the Georgia Guidestone? It's, you know, before they were destroyed. It is precisely the phrase which occurs in 1 Corinthians 8 13, where Paul says that if meat make his brother to offend, he will eat no more meat. Aiston Aiona, for an age during the am. But in the common version, while the word standeth, which seems to me a good translation, but a better rendering would be, as long as I live, as Paul simply meant, to make a strong assertion in regard to the total abstinence from meat, not in eternity, but in his lifetime, we find in Ephesians 3, 9, and Colossians 1, 26, the phrase apoton aionon and in Romans sixteen twenty five Chronois Ioni Ais Yeah, not not O Chronois Ioni Ois the common version renders the first passage from the beginning of the world, the second from ages, and the third since the world began, but the phrase in the first two instances is the same in the original, and strictly translated means from the ages and from the third signifies through long, uh, through age-long times. These citations are made that the reader may see the significance of the word limited by its connections. The Hebrew word which the Septuagint translates by these Greek words is one applied to many things which have passed away, such as the Jewish priesthood, the time for which a person whose ears had been bored might be held in slavery, the doors of the temple, landmarks, waste places, etc. The Aramaic, Aramea is how you really pronounce it, uh, which Jesus used in his discourse was doubtless the best possible represented of the Hebrew and Greek words employed in the Hebrew Bible and in the Greek translation of the evangelist, and therefore the subject to the same interpretations as to those words. Now, biblical Hebrew is actually Aramea.